I feel like you've become <laughs> like the red guy over the last year. Um, you bought a Komodo and you yep. even bought the new, uh, what's it called? The V Raptor. Dude. So tell me about the red and your red journey over the last year. Cause um, yeah, you've really kind of <laughs> gone full into it. Yeah, I know it was not. I mean, so full transparency, when I was first starting out in this industry, like that's when the reds first came out and that was like the goal, you know, that was like the dream. It was like one day, maybe that'll happen. And so that's always kind of been there. But um, for me, I was shooting on, you know, like you mentioned before, like the one DX Mark II, like I definitely went down the DSLR route. And then when mirrorless cameras became more popular, I went down that route. And then um, it was really the year that the Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera came out that I kind of made that jump over to cinema cameras and stopped using photography cameras to shoot video and started really focusing on actual video cameras. And, you know, when Red announced the Komodo and it was going to be $6,000, which, I mean, mind you, that's a little bit more than what I paid for the 1DX Mark II. Um, but now I was getting red raw, I was getting the red sensor and that dynamic range and the skin tones and everything. I was like, all right, this is my chance to jump into the red ecosystem and just see if I like it. And at the time, I was also growing my business. So I started hiring on editors to work within the company. So a lot of stuff was changing. But I can tell you, when I got the Komodo and I started using it, I realized kind of that red difference, like what made reds really stand out. And once you kind of work in red raw on a consistent basis, it's really hard to try to edit video and anything else. Even if the project doesn't necessarily call for red, because you have so much latitude in post, you just are spoiled through the entire color process. So I shot on the Komodo for basically about a year, loving every second of it. And then Red announced the Raptor. And, you know, when they started releasing specs on the Raptor, I, at first I was like, I was like, oh, yes, a new Red to partner with my Komodo. This would be great. But then they were like, 8K, full frame. I was like, out of my price range. <laughs> like, instantly I was like, this camera is going to be $60,000 because that's where the Monstro was sitting. And it had roughly some of the same specs, but this was supposed to be a newer camera. So I immediately thought, okay, this is definitely going to be Monstro price. But it came out at like roughly half the price of the Monstro. So you literally got a camera that was better than the Monstro that was $60,000, but they gave you a V Raptor that was about half the price. And for that, I was like, yeah, this time to get the big brother to my Komodo. So my Komodo can really sit where it's supposed to sit. And that's in that B cam spot. And I can have a V Raptor. And again, my company is at a place now where I have employees and we have offices and, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, HR and all that fun stuff. Um, but that's the reason why we decided to jump full steam into the red was just because there's just something that you get out of working in that red raw. And I just wanted that in the V Raptor on the full frame side and also the ability to have some of those higher frame rates because the Komodo is fairly limited with the Super 35 sensor and having, you know, almost no high frame rates without crazy crops. So the the V Raptor kind of solved all the problems that I had with the Komodo and it was half of what I thought it was going to cost. So it seemed like a worthy investment and it's pretty much already paid itself off um, just by taking it out on new jobs. So it's, I mean, I love the investment. I love the camera, but yeah, I guess I shoot red now. <laughs> That's amazing. You're, you're just like uh, Marquez Brownlee, like taking the, the red um, banner w uh, with you on YouTube. I mean, you're not uh, <laughs> using it primarily as a YouTube camera, but have you used it as you, a YouTube camera? And what are your thoughts on using the Komodo and now the, the Raptor as like a primary YouTube camera with all of your experience now? Like Marquez really is kind of in his own world with that. There's a couple yeah. of other te tech YouTubers that also do that. Do you actually believe now that you have all this experience that that's a little overkill or do you see the reasons why he chooses to do that? So I will say that like when it comes to the, the images that you get out of the red, they are unmatched to me honestly i mean the flexibility the raw like 
you really do have the most. Uh, and when you're shooting content for YouTube, you know, if you are shooting products or you are, sh or you're actually like filming something else, that's not just you. Um, I do see there being a benefit in trying to get the best production quality you can. I mean, for Marquez, he's trying to show off these phones or these other pieces of tech in a way that, you know, you can feel like you are there physically holding the device yourself. That is the experience he is trying to present. And so why not do it at the highest quality you possibly can? That being said, if you are filming yourself, shooting on a red is probably one of the most frustrating things you could possibly do if you are like a one man band and you're trying to film yourself. That's one of the reasons why I still have other cameras around that are great for that. For example, right now I'm shooting this whole podcast setup with the Sony FX3, which is a fantastic camera, has great autofocus, and it's one of my go-to cameras when I have to be the one that films myself and I need to worry about things like audio and focus and all those other elements. You just, that's too much for one person to do with a RED. So one of the big things I always say is, you know, if you're working with a team consistently, then yeah, definitely consider the red, you know, but if it's just you or your other person is focused on audio or your other person is focused on lights and you can't at least have two hands on the camera, then I would say, you know, it's probably overkill, especially just for YouTube. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> when I did my review with the Komodo, with Indie Mogul. And by the way, everybody makes fun of me because it sounds like I'm saying kimono like multiple <laughs> times in that review, um, <laughs> which I kind of agree with. <laughs> so I was going to say, uh, I remember that video. It, it, I thought it was like a, like a joke. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the red kimono. Like I just kind of was letting it roll off the tongue. I definitely knew what I was saying, but I may have actually said kimono a couple of times and just <laughs> left it in. But um, just like, you, yeah. You're the yeah. one. You're the one who told me one of the best <laughs> hacks about YouTube is like say a mistake on purpose so that people in the comments like can start to argue about it. So like, hey, well, you were. It's not you said on this purpose. Or... You don't make the mistake on purpose. But if you make the mistake, I leave it in, and then I yeah. trust my audience in the comment <laughs> section to correct me. You know, uh -huh. like yeah. it's like if I'm in the middle of edit, like I'm not going to go back and reshoot something, especially if it's like vloggy type, like you can't, you can't go back and fix it. So either you could do the little asterisk in the corner to correct yourself, or you just let your audience, you know, you know, have your back in the comments and it gives them more to talk about because honestly in the comment sections where I learn a lot of stuff, like I've said stuff wrong on accident, thought it was right, got the comment section, realized I was 100% wrong and learned a lot from it. And so, you know, YouTube is one of those places where there's a great back and forth. Uh, you just got to be careful about going in the comments. It's not always, it's not always positive. But anyways, yeah, totally. Anyways, back to the red thing. Like I was really kind of impressed with the app and I don't know if you've had any experience using it mm -hmm. um, or have at least tried it as a tripod camera for self-filming. Like the autofocus isn't terrible with the like touch to focus. Is it just not reliable enough for yeah. you when you've got the Sony? Yeah. So, I mean, it really comes down to like, what's the purpose of this now? Um, you know, I will say that you, you technically can do it with the app, but I find that the app, like the phone physically needs to be fairly close to the camera. It does not have great range whatsoever. Uh, and then also you have to be working with RF lenses at that point, which I mean, don't get me wrong. RF lenses are fantastic, especially, you know, like we have a, we have a, a Canon R6 that we use for a lot of BTS stuff around here. And we use RF lenses with that camera. But I just personally feel like when I'm using a cinema camera, I want to be using cinema lenses. And so at that point, all the autofocus features are out the window. And, you know, even Red, as of right now, like the Komodo's been out for about a year and a half, almost two years now. And their autofocus system is still technically part of the beta process. So even though they have full built versions of the operating system on the Raptor and on the Komodo, when you go into the autofocus, if you have an RF lens, it's still beta and it's not fantastic. So I would say if you are going to use it, maybe use an RF lens, 
do not do continuous autofocus. That thing hunts like crazy. But if you want to do like, you know, single shot where it just will lock focus and then it won't rack anymore, just be careful of moving back and forth between the camera. You can get away with it. But at that point, I say, why not just use like an FX3 or a Canon R6 or something so, that so has more saying, reliable. So what you're saying, the autofocus on the red is beta and the autofocus on Sony, Sony is alpha. <laughs> Oh God, that's a good one. That's yeah, a, have you done, have you used that before? No, I literally just like as you were saying all that, my mind thought of that joke. And uh, if you get it, then you get it. Um, so if you don't, I have I'm not... <laughs> until you release this to use that joke as many times as I possibly can. Because <laughs> I one hundred percent am going to steal that joke. <laughs> Please do. Um, okay, cool. And then, so the V Raptor. Uh, tell me about your experience with that, because I have not had any hands-on time with that. Is it very similar to the Komodo? Would you almost say it's just kind of a full-frame, better Komodo, or is there a lot of things about it that you just really love? That yeah, are I mean, new. I personally think that, like you know, the sensor and just the full frameness of it makes a huge difference. I mean. The Super 35 sensor is a little limited, especially in, you know, low light situations or just like how it handles the shadows. The V Raptor miles better. But like I I have this problem when I talk about the V Raptor because I'm like, "Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I love everything about it. It's fantastic, blah 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 blah." But it's also like a $30,000 camera. Like it it better be, you know? Like it's it's kind of like, you know, hyping up something. It's like, oh my God, the Lambo was so amazing. It was like, yeah, it's a freaking Lambo. It better be, right? And so that's the same thing I have with the V Raptor. Like, I love it and I think it's a fantastic camera. The image is beautiful. Some of my favorite shots we've got this year came in the latter part of the year once we started introducing this camera. And it's it's just a fantastic camera to use. I will say though, I 100% enjoy filming with the Komodo more than I enjoy filming with the Raptor, primarily because that touchscreen on the Komodo is like, it's just so easy. It's so easy. And I really wish they would have brought that touchscreen over to the V Raptor. They didn't. There's like this button interface and it's slow and it's a little clunky. And so, um, you know, I have the monitor on order, but I haven't got it in yet. It's the touchscreen seven inch monitor. So I'm assuming once that comes in, my use case will be a little bit better. And then also I use my app. I actually normally have it hooked up to my iPad mini and that helps with the workflow. But if you don't have the phone or it hooked up to some type of device, and as I said, the touchscreens haven't gotten shipped out to everybody yet. Um, it, pushing those buttons on the side, they're they're not ideal. I mean, simple things like just trying to magnify in so you can go ahead and, you know, pull focus and make sure your focus is tack sharp can take like, you know, easily 20 to 30 seconds. And it doesn't sound like much, but when you have a client or you're on set and you're just trying to quickly just magnify in, it'd be much nicer to just tap on the screen to do that. Well, Red has kind of always been known for having incredible touchscreen support. I mean, the touchscreens themselves, especially on those older reds were basically like early Android phone level, like in terms of mm -hmm. like when you, when you would try to change the ISO, you end up like swiping it like five times over and over. Um, and I was always just like, ah, freaking dad, work like an iPhone, you know, but <laughs> um, they got better over time and stuff. And I think small HD now is making some that work for it too, right? Like they're kind of yeah. partnered together. So actually the the one that Red Red did something really unique with the Komodo and with the Raptor is like they're not actually making all the accessories. They're partnering with companies to make the accessories. So like for example, I just happen to have them here, but like these two like Red official memory cards. So like this is the uh the this is the CF Express and this is the CFast card and they're both branded. They say Red on them, but like they're actually made by Angel Bird. Like they, and they say it. They have Angel Bird's logo and everything on it. Um, the same with the monitor. The monitor that is the official red monitor for the V Raptor is actually made by Small HD. And so it's doing a couple of things. It's, you know, one, 
it's you know bringing in the actual industry leaders in those areas so maybe now red can actually just focus more on their cameras and their customer support which i can say is fantastic uh, i've had some support with the v raptor already and they're just amazing every time i talk to them but uh i will also say that like the accessories that even the red branded accessories are in my opinion better than the original red accessories and i think that's just because red's kind of giving some of that you know attention to detail to other areas and bringing in partners that can focus on the accessories the right way and they're doing what they do best you know small hd makes monitors why not have them make the red monitor Totally. I, that's a brilliant idea. And I'm surprised it took them so long to figure that out because it's a great way to kind of offload the work that they don't really want to do. They're still a part of it. So it still kind of has that red touch. If you look at the monitor, it still looks like one of those red monitors. In fact, um, if you remember the, I think the original like Epic one, I think it said red pro seven on it or something. 7.0. Mm -hmm. Is that what the old one said? I think. Um, but something I remember like every, that. <clears throat> every time we do a shoot with the red, people would see the monitor and they'd be like, oh, are you shooting on the uh, the old Red Pro 7? <laughs> I'm like, no, that's the monitor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's just the monitor. <laughs> such a muggle. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? 